get started or okay all right so hello everybody my name is John Mark Gurney I will be talking about my work on adding AES ICM and ESG, AES GCM to the FreeBSD kernel first of all I'll start off with a little bit about myself um, I've been using FreeBSD since the original 1151 and have been a committer since 1997 so I've been around and seen lots of different things. So, But about 12 years ago, I actually started um, working in the security industry. I had been interested in security for a very long time. I started using SSH almost immediately once it got released, once I realized it's like, your passwords are in the clear on the network whenever you tell net into a box. That's probably not a good thing. <laughs> So, uh, but I never did much with security until I started working at NCircle. And then a few years after working at NCircle, I worked for a company called Cryptography Research. Um, I was never very much of a cryptography person, algorithms or anything, but after spending six and a half years working with people who do that for a living, you're bound to learn a thing or two about cryptography. So. It was um, during that period that I started doing some work on AES&I. Um, originally, I was, um, if you were here last year, you may actually have attended my talk on adding AES-XTS to the FreeBSD kernel. And that was purely in order to make my hard, encrypted hard drives perform faster. Encrypted hard drives means RMA is much easier and quicker. So after doing that, um, it became um, Jim Thompson from NetGate approached me and was like, we would like to have add additional modes to um, um, FreeBSD ZipSec. Um, and so he contacted me and I decided, um, decided to do some work. So why, why did I do the ASGCM? So one of the things is, is that um, AES-GCM actually performs significantly faster than the most common existing AES mode, and that is AES-CVC. I'll get into that in a little bit more. Um, security is another good point. Um, AES-GCM is a AEAD mode. That means authenticated encryption with associated data. The importance behind this is that um, Normal encryption does not actually say anything about the trustworthiness of this data. So this um, means that the attackers can do whatever they want with the encrypted data. They can manipulate it. They can fudge the data. And so encryption is not uh, the end all be all. You need to actually have authentication. Without authentication, you don't. Um, Encryption provides confidentiality. Authentication lets you actually trust who it is. And as I mentioned, the reason Jim Thompson wanted me to do this was that um, out in the real world, ASGCM was a com um, commonly used for IPsec. Uh, I will mo today I will be mostly talking about GCM because that is actually the interesting problem. And ICM is actually, um, as you'll find out shortly, really a sub-problem of GCM. So, as I mentioned, why not CBC? Now, I've used this talk before, but this may not be apparent. But it turns out that the block cipher encryption step is the really expensive step in um, um, crypto. XOR, very cheap. You already have your plain text, IV, nothing else much to do. It turns out that because of the expensiveness of it, if you notice, I cannot start encrypting this next block until I have fully encrypted this block. And that means that you are limited by how fast your AES cipher run things. You cannot do any pipeline or parallelization in order to improve performance. And um, that means that um, it turns out that um, when you do decryption on CBC, you don't actually have that because you always have the next ciphertext and you can do all this and thing. If you actually run performance um, benchmarks on 
uh, using like OpenSSL or whatever, you'll actually find out that um, CVC mode only runs about 600 megabytes a second, where de um, for encryption, where well, decrypt can run at like three to four gigabytes per second. So don't know about you, but I'd much rather have three to four gigabytes per second. So what specifically is ASGCM? So as I mentioned earlier, ASGCM is a combined authenticated encryption with associated data mode. So the encryption part is this part, and, that, and as you can see, we're using a counter. And so the EK, which is the encryption, which is the AES step, can be done pr um, completely independent of each other. And we feed in the thing. Now, the other part is, is the authentication part. This authentication part um, with the uh, uh, associated data is what makes sure that everything happens. The same key is used, and it outputs an auth tag. The length of the auth tag can be changed, but it is recommended to be at least 64 bits. If you go much shorter, it is likely that you, um, an attacker would be able to forge it. You could do up as much as 128 bits, but um, that all depends on exactly what you're doing. So the, uh, this is, um, yeah. And one of the other key parts about that is, is that if you know the very last step is, is that you have the length of the authenticated data and the length of the cipher text. If you don't have that embedded, that means the attacker could actually maybe say change where the authenticated data changed and other stuff or shave a few bits off and that would not be good. So one of the, well, I forgot about this. So what the, as the EK is the AES step. Tur uh, MULT H is a special um, uh, GAWA field multiply over uh, GF2 to the 128. Um, and I will now be getting into that. So, Galois field, sorry about the math, if you're, but it turns out that um, Galois field math is not as complicated. I spent a while, it takes a lot of convincing yourself that it isn't that complicated, but it is actually. So, in Galois field math, addition is carryless. That, unlike the traditional where you add five plus five and you come up with 10, if Gawa field was, if you were doing a Gawa field of 10, 5 plus 5 would actually end up being 0. So in this case, in we're doing binary, um, instead of 1 plus 1 being 1, 0, you actually just end up with 0. And that in, ends up with the equivalent of XOR or the mathematical symbol circle plus, which is used quite often. And, as, and so multiplication works, believe it or not, exactly the same way that you do multi-digit multiplication. You know, if you do 15 times 15, or 15 times 23, you know, you do all the long school book, do the additions, and Galois field math works exactly the same way, but except for, as I mentioned earlier, your additions does not carry. So in my little quick example of a, a 1, 1 binary multiplied by 1, 1 binary, you do the you add the zero because you're multiplying that in the twos position, and you add it with the one one, and you end up with one zero one instead of the tradition. Uh, if you had done this with normal carry list, it would be what was it, what would it be? It'd be like I forget what it is. Well, one, zero, zero, zero. Yeah, that's why I was thinking it was. But and so, but so one minor difference is is that since we're doing GF to the 128, we need to add a reducing factor whenever our value is larger to, um, than 128. Um, this is, um, each different field in GF128 has a different reducing factor. Um, this is um, commonly used a, a irreducible polynomial. I don't like that term because polynomials get all confusing and it makes, there's a whole different notation that you very often see where it's x times two to the 128 plus x plus one and other stuff and I've always been confused by that. I'm not that thing. And it also turns out, and this will be very important later on, is, is that in uh, GF2 um, GF to 128, distribution works. Meaning if you do a plus b times c, 
you can distribute the C over to the A plus B, and therefore it is the equivalent to A times C plus uh, B times C. And so there's interesting tricks that we'll be able to play with that. So there's always dangers in implementing different parts of crypto. And um, uh, when I was working at CRI, they developed numerous different techniques on attacking systems through side channels such as EMI, and, but um, they were not so much onto the computer side, but they were still needed to keep abreast of the various attacks. So back in 2010, um, Bonin Hung wrote his master's thesis on attacking AES GCM, GCM secret of authentication value H, which I talked about a little bit earlier. And in this paper, he, iterate, he basically goes through and shows that um, if your Galois field math is not exactly constant time, and you do th um, various speed ups where you do pre-compute tables in order to improve performance and doing 8-bit stuff, you can actually snoop on the cache line, figure out what values are being used on the secret values H, and um, figure out actually what H is. And then once you figure out what H, as we saw here, if you know H, you can actually um, forge any message that you want. So uh, yes? Is it that it's, um, uh, say, an SBOX implementation of AES, like would a, uh, an ARX cipher in that mode have the same side channel? Or like, or is it different AES that's being used? So in his paper, he was attacking purely the Galois field math and not the AES side channel. But as, um, a, as the second bullet points out, uh, there are well-known attack, um, side channel attacks for the standard five table version of AES because um, when you're doing the um, SBOX lookup, um, you, you have information and um, the SBOX lookup is, oftenly, is most often implemented as a 256-byte array to do the lookup, and then that becomes complicated. There's, luckily, if you have access to SSE registers, there's other things that you can do to mitigate that, assuming you don't have ASNI, but, yes? How is that attack uh, exploitable in practice? So, So um, I'll have a reference to this paper. This is a DJB paper. Yeah. So. So uh, this pa I, as you, you as you said, you're familiar with this paper. This paper that he actually demonstrates that the cache timing attack is uh, vulnerable over the network. So. And it, so it, it, com it comes down to more complicated, obviously. Um, there, um, part of it is depends upon how long keys are used, how much data is used. Um, with um, a, um, technology like DPA and other stuff, it is as long as there is leakage you, with enough traces, you will be able to extract what you want. Um, when I would... Uh, at, at CRI, we've done a number of different things where, um, where a friend of mine who was working on the project, I worked with him on some stuff, you, he basically said that on hardware using DPA, you could actually target individual transistors on a chip. So, um, and when you're going attacking over the network, the network just adds a little bit of noise, but it's still, um, but you, the, the data is still there. You just need to average out the noise. It's, and it depends upon how long, how long, how many traces you can provide to lower your noise floor and average out the noise. Does that make sense, or? Yes, but there is noise from the processor itself. Yes, but the noise from the processor itself is uncorrelated to what you're attacking. And because of that, as you um, a tr a collect additional information, the uncorrelated noise will drop out and only the correlation that you're targeting. But how can you find correlation if you are trying to analyze the uh, pseudo random output? So w you actually basically, um, when you collect all these, I'm, I'm getting in more into DPA, but um, you collect traces and then you say, I'm going to guess that this, uh, um, I'm going to guess at this S box, 
I'm going to guess that this value is either z um, 0, 0 or through 255. And you sort all of your traces based upon this. And you look at the averages. And the ones that don't are. Are you talking are about traces snooping or chosen ciphertext? Uh, chosen ciphertext. Yeah, yeah. I mean, passive snooping, it's more difficult to do because I'll, you're obviously not injecting anything. So, um, And also the other, um, it also turns out like um, other things that need to be constant time is uh, comparing the tag itself because as you may know that. but <laughs> And so um, there's been a number of vulnerabilities where, and that is part of the reason why we now actually have um, um, timing. Um, memcomp timing safe version in the kernel. Um, one of the other interesting things, though, is, is that, believe it or not, counteracting side channels can improve performance. While I was doing this work, I imported OpenBSD's version of GCM. And when I first I was doing benchmarking, seeing how to improve performance, and I mistakenly ended up swapping the two values. I um, to the Gawa field math. Now, normally, this should not be a problem because, well, as we know, you can swap, um, when you're doing mul multiplication, 15 times 20 is the same as 20 times 15. But the problem was is that their implementation assumed that one side, um, one side of the multiplication was um, they were doing constant time, but then they were doing an if statement based upon the other. So. In the case of GCM, when we go back to the, uh, sorry, when we go back to here, we're doing this ciphertext is public text, but this H value is not. And so if you swap the two values around, suddenly the, you're now branching on H and leaking information about the private value. And when I discovered this, I was quite distressed because it was sad to make this. I ended up look, um, um, doing a little tweak to make this constant time. And it turns out that the performance improved. Because now, instead of this if statement in a loop that was iterating 128 times, I now was doing a few bit of extra math, but I wasn't mispredicting the branch. And so performance actually improved. The, alg um, the code was effectively constant time and close the side channel attack. Uh, OpenBSD has actually adopted that patch in their tree. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the ways that you improve um, performance of uh, GAWA field math is by doing lookup tables. Because you can, um, pe people were doing traditional like eight, um, eight bits at a time, calculate what the GAWA field math uh, against H was, calculating it. But as, we, as I discussed earlier, uh, cash, ha um, cash effects, you can actually figure out exactly what values you're multiplying against. So um, the, um, some people at NSS, I forget the other um, who are working on that library, were doing some investigation. And it turns out that um, DJB and I forget somebody else actually found out that intra-cache line accesses actually had variation. The first 64 bits of a cache line were actually accessed much quicker than the remaining bits of a cache line. And so even though you would think it was the same, it is not. And so one of the proposals that they put forward was in order to help mitigate this, it's still as because of the cache line, uh, intra-cache line access, it doesn't completely solve the side channel, but it helps mitigate is instead when you have a 16 row lookup table, you split it in, into four four bytes, so 16 bytes for each of the GF to the 128 entries. And then you split them against four ca um, across four cache lines. And so now, if you look, when you look up the table, since you access all four cache lines, you are no longer, um, <coughs> since um, you, do, you do not have as much of a um, footprint. Obviously, the first two entries, in this case, because that those access faster, you'll be able to tell those, but the remaining won't. And it really comes down to um, compromises that you have to make. 
be improving, adding this performance, I forget that I don't have the numbers right now, but adding this improves the software implementation significantly. Now instead of, um, you know, I'm going through the last four times as often, I'm accessing memory and other stuff. Um, so there are improvements and you really have to decide how many, how much leakage do you want versus how fast you want. You can make things extremely secure, but if it runs at 10 megabytes per second, nobody's going to use it. You know, if it runs at a few hundred megs, then they might actually use it. And as you know, there's a lot of different noises in the systems. Turns out the slower systems are a little bit easier, more easily attacked than otherwise. So, the as part of my research, there are intra, um, I alluded to some of these interesting opportunities. Um, when we go, if you remember the GCM, we basically always did a multiply, added it to a next value, and then multiplied the resulting value. And so that's the equivalent of A, A times H plus B times H plus C times H. Those are a lot of parentheses. But because of the distribution property, we can actually pull out all of those H's and distribute them. And now we have a much easier and less dependent version where a, um, a times h to the 4 plus b times h to the 3rd plus c times h squared um, plus d times h. And so now we can actually pre-compute h, h to the 4, h cubed, h squared, and h, have tables on those and do lookups as a, and then decouple this. This was uh, the technique used on the, by the Intel PCL mold QDQ power, um, carryless multiply paper in order, um, in order to improve their performance because the PCL mold QDQ instruction actually had significant latency and they couldn't, we wanted to hide that. So being able to distribute that. Turns out that when I was working on the software implementation, um, I noticed that my, the software Galois field math was, ac was not actually using very many registers. It was like using two or three registers where even on I386 we have at least eight. And so I ended up applying this exact same performance benefit and got a significant performance boost. I think it was like over 50% to that. So obvi obviously a large part of this is ASNI helps completely avoid um, cache timing attacks. Um, and that is because it actually implements the thing and we don't have to do lookup tables. Um, one of the interesting parts of um, the PCL mole QDQ instruction is that Intel did not actually specify it as a full 128-bit multiply. When you do the multiply, you get 60, you multiply 60, two 64-bit numbers and end up with a 128-bit number. So that means that you need to do extra work in order to do the 128-bit multiplies that we need for ASGCM. Now, it turns out that if you just think a little bit differently, uh, the the traditional way that you can do this is just the same way that you multiply the two two-digit numbers, except for in this case, they happen to be uh, two 64-bit digit numbers. And this actually works for any, si any word size that you're, you're targ targeting about. When I was at CRI, I actually wrote some multiplication routines and division routines that was targeting a 600-bit number size. So it's kind of a odd to think about having a single digit contain 600 bits, but that entirely happens. So. Um, as this work was actually um, funded by the FreeBSD Foundation, one of the requirements that they have was um, um, to review the code. So um, when I had the code reviewed by, um, I, I believe this code was reviewed by Watson Lad, he pointed out one of the things that um, is very dangerous about ASGCM, since GCM is in counter mode, counter mode does not use what, it, what is normally called an IV, it uses what is called a nonce. If you end up reusing um, um, AES counter mode is effectively a cipher stream that you XOR. It's just a simple way to generate unpredictable noise. It's kind of like generating a one-time pad that you XOR onto it, 
but with very small amounts of data, the key plus the nonce. The problem, though, is the sense of counter increments. If you were able to replay a counter, you would actually end up with um, the exact same key stream, and you'd be able to take two ciphertexts, XOR them together at the appropriate parts, and you'd now get the XOR difference between text. And it turns out, if you like XOR two English text together, you're probably able to figure out exactly what the two texts are. It's not a very good thing. So one of the requirements that we ended up doing was that for both ASGCM and for counter mode, we actually, instead of allowing, um, like in the case of CBC, where if you don't specify an IV, it'll generate random data, the code actually requires you to generate, uh, um, actually specify the nonce. And so it, um, if you know what you're doing, you know how to um, generate a unique nonce, and you're safe. If you don't know what you're doing, well, you shouldn't be writing crypto code. So, <laughs> um, and so, but this actually ensures that the user of the ASGCM code can ensure that they ha have the crypt um, secure cryptographic pr primitives that they want. The other interesting thing is, is when I was uh, implementing um, the ASGCM code, I actually found a bug in the reference paper implementing GCM. When they were doing the decrypt, as part of the decrypt phase, you want to do the, all of the authentication, um, authenticate that all the ciphertext is safe, and then you can do the decryption. It turns out that the comparison of the tag that was calculated was not done correctly. It, it actually was verifying that all the bits in the tag provided were set in this and the, the, as the generated tags were, but you could I, I forget if um, you could either like you, you could either specify a tag of all zeros or all ones, and it would always work. <laughs> so obviously not a very uh, very good thing. Luckily, I sent sent him an email, and that was fixed in the next release of the paper. But. As you can see, reviews are absolutely necessary when you're coming across crypto code. And that code in his paper was actually um, on, on Intel's website for over two years before it was fixed. And off, obviously, testing and verification are too. Part of the discovery of that bug was the fact that I was generating knowingly incorrect data and comparing it but it was actually doing decryption and passing, and I'm like, that should not pass data that I know is not correct. And so as part of this work, I set up an additional set of um, tests that are actually now distributed entirely part of FreeBSD. They're under, um, and they're actually, if you have installed, a, um, have a head system from within like about six months or more, if you go into user tests, sys, open crypto, run um, crypto, you'll see a script that they're, um, that run tests and will actually run tests against this code. The tests require that you have Python and the NIST cat ports installed. Um, and the NIST cat port is basically a set of known answers to various crypto algorithms that are distributed by the, um, by the NIST government agency. And so that's the standard check CBC. There's like SHA-256 and some other stuff. So I would like to thank both NetGate and the FreeBSD Foundation for uh, encouraging me and providing funding for this work. And then also I would like to thank my reviewers, Mike Hamburg and Watson Ladd, for their work uh, doing the review and other stuff. So, And the papers that I review uh, mentioned are here so does anybody have any questions on yes sure so just going back to the um the as counter mode um so i've seen implementations where uh because they're generating a key for each instance they don't bother to uh to set the nonce and and so is it because uh in most contexts in gcm you're not rekeying is why the nonce so when if yeah, as long as it, it like the 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 whole point the thing that needs to be protected in both GCM and in um, 
EIS counter mode, as you said, as ensure that the key and the nonce are never reused. Yeah. So if you always have a new key, then you only have, and the nonce is all zeros, then that is perfectly safe since you're never using the two together. The, you, the reason why most people don't do that is because key distribution is very, very difficult. And you can, I forget what the sizes is, but you can encrypt like multiple terabytes of um, data with this. Um, the, I can go in a little bit more specifics. In the GCM, they, um, they use 96, uh, the counter is 128 bits. The nonce is 96 bits. And at 96 bits, that's too small to use random. If they were using a full 128 bit, you could use random, but then you also have the problem that if you actually encrypt four gigs of data, then you're back down to 96, and then there's likely an overlap. And so in GCM, they have a 32-bit nonce, and so that and because um, so that means that that you can encrypt um, what is it uh, two to the like 36 bytes worth of data per authentication without actually rolling over, and then also um, yeah. So does that answer? Yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. But yeah, so as long as you, the whole key part, and then um, I, ICM is literally just this part of GCM, so. Any other questions? Yes. Un un unrelated to the, this work, um, I saw some stuff floating around uh, FreeBSD 10.2 and Intel Quick Assist. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim can probably talk a little bit more on uh, Quick Assist there. I, kn I know that they're working on it. I'm not sure how much, um, how ready or other stuff they're about. Do you want to say anything, Jim, or? <laughs> okay. So, so I, I know there's people interested in it and stuff, but yeah, it's, there's, there, yeah, it's not. So, any other questions or? All right, well, thank you for attending.